Jamie X is going to talk to you about RNS experimental notes. All right, good afternoon, guys. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, today, my talk's the regular and special $1 experimentals. Um, as many of you know, and some of you may not know, um, I spent a lot of my time doing research down at the National Archives in College Park, Maryland. I live in New Jersey, so it's a convenient day trip for me. Um, a couple years ago, Lee Luftis, uh, who isn't here this, this year, uh, introduced Pete and I to a bunch of boxes which are files of the Bureau of Public Debt. Um, the Bureau of Public Debt um, is a group, they still exist today, they're under a different name, but they were responsible for keeping track of, I guess, the government's debts. I haven't really researched them that well. Um, but they are very important when it comes to a lot of the changes that we saw in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s and the 50s to our currency. There's 19, I guess there's 18 of these boxes. This is basically what they look like. Um, the depth is about 18 inches and they're full from front to back with files. Maybe six or seven years ago, I started going through them like a kid at Christmas. You know, you run down, you just rip that thing open, you start taking stuff out, you're not very thorough. A year ago on my last two trips, I've been going back down to the archives, pulling these boxes in number order, one, two, three, four, five, six and going through them with a fine tooth comb. On a trip this past December, okay, I ran across, uh, I don't remember, I think it was box seven, um, ran across a folder entitled currency, condition in circulation, life test, etc. cetera, um, printed from currency paper mirror melamine sizing. This is a typical cover sheet that you see on the files. I believe the National Archives typed these things up. I don't think they came from the Treasury. I probably passed this file a couple times in the past and missed that little handwriting right there that basically said RNS silver certificates. So when I found it back in December, you know, hey, this gets me excited. All right, so your heart starts to flutter, you go crazy. Uh, there's some holy grails we all have as researchers, this is kind of one of them. So found this, it's about 40 pages worth of documents. Photographed them all, came home, emailed Pete, said, hey, look, and you gotta see what I found. And this is what I got, all right? Now, is currency paper really paper? No, right, no. It's actually a cloth made of cotton and linen, all right? It's closer to the jeans you're wearing than the paper you read in the morning, all right? What I've found looking at these BPD records is that the BP was constantly experimenting, looking for ways to improve currency paper, all right? They're basically a factory. They produce a product, okay, which is paper money as well as some other fiscal documents. And they're always trying to do two things down at the bottom. They're trying to improve the wearing qualities, which means once they put a note in circulation, they want it to last as long as it possibly can. They also try to improve the printing qualities, which means as it goes through the processes of being made and sized, all these, you know, I'm not a paper chemist or scientist, but there's a lot of different ways they have to treat paper before they intaglio print it, and then of course put serial numbers on it and send it out. So they're always looking to improve those two different kinds of qualities. And I've noticed through trial and error and looking at these files, so they kind of have a pattern of what they do. They test the paper, which means they just get paper from Crane, which is their normal supplier, maybe a different supplier, and they just kind of send it around, you know, like you would in an office. Hey, check this out. What do you think? Crumple it up. Let's do a few things with it. All right. They may print it. They may actually put it through an Italian printing press, put a face and a back on it, keep it unifaced, keep it dual faced. Again, let's send it around internally. Let's compare it to real notes. Let's see what's going on. The third thing they do is what I found out in these documents they call a life test, which means they take the paper, they put it through the normal production scheme, they number it, they send it out into circulation, and they hope to get some back, and then they compare it to real currency to actually see, what, uh, to see what's going on. Now, the next few slides, um, it's not RNS, it's actually some documents that I found, I've not published them yet, of other experiments. What's great about these documents is they list serial numbers. All right, so here's a document, William Broughton, which is the second guy down at the bottom. I don't know who the top gentleman is. Um, he was the Bureau of Public Debt Director. You're gonna see him a lot. You probably heard him a lot. But these are three apparently experimental lots of silver certificates printed on special paper. I don't know what the special paper is. Um, but you can see one of them's heavier. Maybe the paper stock is a little thicker. Um, the, bottom, the middle one here, standard paper containing 1% titanium dioxide. The next slide, I'll go into that a little more. And then here's this standard paper at the bottom with a special furnish. Frustratingly, what you find is this. 
Look at these serial numbers. Hey, I just gave you guys three brand new varieties to go out and chase. Well, guess what? I don't know if they were ever issued. Don't really know. And that's the frustrating thing. You find this stuff, but then sometimes it's a dead end. You don't go anywhere with it. The titanium dioxide notes, I actually wrote up an article about this a couple years ago. These were issued. Basically what titanium dioxide is, it's a whitener. When you add it to paper, it makes the paper more opaque. So that when you print it, you don't see the other side through it. Um, for those of you who collect small size, maybe some large size, the early 28s, paper was kind of, wasn't any thinner, but it just, it, it was more translucent. And if you get a real crisp note, you can see the back or the face right through it without even passing it through light. So they were trying to make the paper more opaque so that you didn't have that transfer um, when you added it. Uh, these notes were sent out, I believe, through uh, the Federal Bank, Reserve Bank St. Louis. Um, you can see there's some branch banks on there. There's serial numbers. I believe they were all 35 A's. Uh, as far as I know, these were issued. Wrote the article a few years ago. I don't know, find them for me, let me know. What happened, what did I do? Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, this is another uh, article, uh, one, one document I found. Um, silk is the fiber that's in currency. Well, they tried during the war to start using nylon. Um, a theory I'd heard was silk was used for parachutes, and so they wanted a replacement. I don't know if that's true or not. But uh, this is just another experiment where basically they received paper from Crean, I believe, with silk and nylon threads in it to see what the difference was. Um, I don't know if these were ever, well actually this second paragraph here, uh, brought in his, or Hall, Alvin Hall, who's BEP director, is basically saying, hey, we got this special paper, we back printed it, let's face print it, and I propose that we put them into circulation. Again, this is what's frustrating. Were they ever put into circulation? I don't know. I've never found another document that continues the story, gives me uh, serial numbers or anything. This is Collins paper. I've seen these floating around. Collins was a different manufacturer of standard currency paper. Um, Crane has been the manufacturer since 1879, I believe, and the BEPs kind of occasionally looked for other suppliers. Collins was one. Uh, the Gilbert paper, I believe, from the 1960s was another one. Again, these are serial numbers. Um, $1 silver certificates, $5 US notes, uh, delivered to the treasurer and from what I presume put into circulation. I'm not quite sure. Um, these are kind of cool here and let me read this a little bit. These are large size 1923 silver certificates. Um, this is William Broughton, his scraggly little handwriting. It's actually worse than mine. He's sending this to Hall. He's basically saying, hey listen, um, we got $200 in face amount of these special silver certificates back from circulation. Let's put them through some tests and see what we can do on them. This is a listing. This was attached to that sheet. This is a list of 23, Series 23 $1 silver certificates, serial numbers, and the date that they were basically redeemed by a bank. Uh, this is another file, same thing. Following information submitted relative deliveries of notes printed on special paper. Uh, these are all delivered to the Office of the Treasurer. Uh, they're all 23 $1 silver certificates. This is special B paper. This is special C paper. This is special D paper. I don't know what the papers are. I've never found other documents that delineate that, but there's all serial numbers. Now, sometimes what I've kind of noticed, depending on how many notes they printed, gives you an idea of maybe whether they put them into circulation. If they're printing two or 4,000 notes, that's probably just internal. They want to see what a finished note's going to look like. If they're printing a few million, they're probably going to send them out into circulation to see if they come back. Um, again, I don't know what happened with this right here, but these are just some examples of, you guys have never heard it, I haven't told the story completely because I have so little to tell, but they were doing this stuff constantly and they were putting serial numbers on notes, a lot of it stayed inside, some of it went outside. Now, what you're most familiar with, of course, are the three, now four, four, excuse me, uh, life tests that they did with $1 silver. So you're all familiar with the 28 A's and the 28 B's, the XB's, the YB's, and the ZB's. Okay, we all know about the A, B, 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 and C, B's, and I have documents on these too. There's 50, 60, 70 pages worth of stuff in the archives. I have partial stuff. This is why I need to go back and get the rest. Um, I believe these papers were special finishes that they were doing to treat the paper before they put it into circulation. This, of course, was something new that Pete and I wrote about. Um, it's kind of a repeat, almost, not exactly, of the 1928 A's. Um, Yep, 1935A. So uh, that's one note I got. I don't know where an XB or a ZB are. They did it on all those blocks. All right. So 
there's a lot more where I see just, hey, we got this special paper. What do you think of it? A lot of that's going, they were constantly looking for ways to improve their currency. I believe, what's the statistic? The statistic. A note only lasts for like 18 months in circulation, right? And most, like 85% of what the BP prints every year is to replace just worn notes from circulation. So they're spending a lot of money. They get a huge margin on it, but they're spending a lot of money and time and effort simply just replacing what they produced a year ago. So if they can do anything to make that longevity better, they're going to go ahead and do it. So as it pertains to RNSs, what I've noticed is that in the 1940s, the Treasury and the BEP started experimenting with papers that contain resins, basically plastics. All right. This is melamine. Probably didn't think you were going to come get a chemistry instruction today, but you're going to get it. All right. This is melamine. Basically, it's a carbon ring with three nitrogens on it, and it's got three amine groups going around the end. Melamine will basically combine with formaldehyde, a little bit of heat, and it'll create a polymer. It'll just chain itself together and create this plastic chain, so to speak. And so what the BP was doing was, Crane actually was doing it. When they were making the paper pulp, they were adding like 1% or 2% melamine to it. And melamine is basically going to have these active sites. And it'll combine, it'll attach itself to some of the active sites on cellulose, which is the compound that cloth, you know, um, cotton and linen or, or, kind of, or cotton's made of. It'll combine itself to that and it'll basically become impregnated throughout the paper when they lay it out and they make this paper. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to increase a quality of paper, which I learned is called wet strength paper. Okay. Wet strength paper is paper in which the fiber constituents are chemically altered to retain as much of their dry strength as they can when they get wet. So here's the great analogy that I thought about this morning. Think about the commercials you've seen for paper towels. Bounty, pick one, I don't know which one's out there, right? Where they take the paper towel, they take two of them, they put them on a table, they squirt some blue water on it so you can see where it's moist. They put a stack of quarters on it and they lift up the paper towel. And the one they want you to buy, man, it can hold the truck. The one they don't want you to buy, the quarters fall right through, right? That's basically an example of wet strength. They're telling you that this paper towel, when it gets wet, will maintain a portion of its dry strength. And that's basically what the BEP is trying to do. Moisture is one of the things that kills a currency note. When it gets moist, it gets wet, um, it, it degrades the fibers, it ruptures the fibers, it makes them much easier to break. So they're looking for paper that will withstand that moisture better. It won't absorb so much moisture. It'll stay stronger. Um, wet strength, actually looking at this, resins are added to a lot of things that we use today, tissues, paper towels, um, certain paper bags you might get in the supermarket. I never knew it, but a lot of them have plastics in them to give them that wet strength so that when you're using them, they don't break on you. All right. So the BP and the Treasury are starting to get this stuff from Crane. They're doing some tests internally. Okay. They deal a lot with the Bureau of Standards, which sometimes they'll get paper. They'll send some to the Bureau of Standards. They'll do some internally. So they're not numbering any of this stuff. They're just doing it internally. Now, this is some guy. His name is B.W. Scribner. He was chief of the paper division of Bureau of Standards. In a September 1943 letter, God bless you, by the way, um, he writes this and makes a comment about melamine resin in currency paper, standard currency paper, greatly increased the bursting strength, tensile strength, stretch, folding, inherence, and resistance to crumpling. Okay, so he's basically saying, hey, compared to the standard paper we've been using, this stuff is awesome. And at the bottom, you can see another benefit is greatly increased wet strength. Nothing gets past this man, this is Alvin Hall, because he's the guy who's actually got to use it. He's got to make it practical. He's got to make it work. All right. Um, great photo of that, actually. I found, um, no, I think Lee Luftus has this in his files, um, just in his little office. Looks kind of nice. Longest serving director, uh, made, really handled all the changes we saw from small size to large size, the mules. Everything that you know you read about from the World War II era, he was central on. He looks at the same paper. This is October 43. He says, some time ago, we got this paper from Crane. We put it through a bunch of tests. All right. We compared it to regular paper without the melamine resin. And he made this kind of interesting comment where he says, the melamine resin inhibited distribution of moisture in the paper. All right. In the printing of currency by the entire process, uniform distribution of moisture is paramount 
the printing process. Now, what he's talking about is back then, this is 1940s, uh, up until the 1960s, paper was wet printed. So they took a sheet and they had to moisten it. And I believe they did this with large, just wet, almost like uh, uh, one of my like spa rooms, where they just had these big rooms with just heavy, heavy, humid moisture, and it just it absorbed into the paper. They put it on the entire printing presses. They do that for the back printing and then the face printing. They didn't need to do it for the serial numbering. But it was paramount that the sheet was uniformly wet. Well, okay, they're adding this plastic that is increasing the strength of the paper, but it also has some hydrophobic qualities to it. It doesn't like water. So now he's kind of noticing, all right, it's great, it's strong, but when I try to actually put it through my printing process, it's creating some problems. All right, maybe they're getting sheets that aren't uniformly wet. There's some dry spots. Maybe some are a little less wet than others. All right, but he says, and the rest of this, he says, you know what? We're going to put it through the trial anyway. We're going to do some of the stuff, we're going to throw it into circulation, we're going to see what's going on. So this is William Broughton, BPD Commissioner, 1919 to 1945. Most of the correspondence I found, him and Hall, they're, they're hand on hand. They're back and forth, correspondence between them. Hall says yes, he says yes, Hall says no, he says no, they go back and forth. A lot of, um, Hall contacts Broughton and basically says, let's put this stuff into circulation. So here's one of the letters, this is where it starts. We're talking March 1944, all right? This is Broughton, who's sending a note to Hall, and he's basically saying, hey, let's take this paper and let's put it into circulation. But let's do it a little differently than we've done the first three, which means we didn't identify the notes in any special way, all right? Maybe we put a different serial number sequence on them, which they did with the, I think with the Y, X, the X, Y, the X, B, Y, B, and Z, Bs. They were using a serial number that wasn't current, but otherwise the notes looked identical to anything that's out there. All right. He's explaining basically that we're going to mark them, and we know they were marked with an R and an S, okay? But we're going to put that mark in a place where the sorters will see it. That's why that little R and S is right next to the seal. Because he's saying here, when these notes are being, when, when they're counting redeemed notes, they're looking at the seals. So if you put it right next to the seal, they're not going to miss it. All right. Specially marked notes may be detected at the time if the characteristic marking is placed close in relation to the treasury seal. Okay. Three-eighths of an inch in height. And he's telling Hall, if you find it possible to imprint these specialized at the time the notes are numbered, of course you can do it in blue. So he gave Hall the option, you want to print it when you do the seal and the serial numbers, go ahead. It means they would have had to redo their numbering presses to add the little R and the S on there. Obviously, as we know, he decided to do a separate printing step with red ink and different printing process. All right. Now this is kind of interesting here. A suggestion that the following letters be used, regular, special, and T for titanium. Now I mentioned before that I have some documentation that they added titanium dioxide, the notes. Um, none have ever had a T on them, so I don't think that ever got that way. So this is a, a photo I found in the archives. Um, it's showing you, a, this is, I believe, from the Division of Loans and Currency, which was the one department in the Treasury that got canceled and redeemed notes. You can see the gentleman, he's got a stack. You can kind of see here, it's kind of small, but that's the bottom half of a $1 silver certificate. And it's got the seal right there, and I don't think that's an R or S note, but that's what they would be looking at. Putting that R and S there, it would be obvious as you wouldn't believe. So, Let's do a test, okay? Find me the experimental. And there's one in there. Exactly, whoo, right? Now, uh, you know, I'll give you a couple seconds. Okay, yes. Took you a little longer, all right? You weren't supposed to find it, thanks for, no, just kidding. So, now just, it, obviously this is real simple, but imagine, uh, imagine being a counter and, if, and, and not even a, in, in the treasury department where these notes are nicely kind of banded and cut in half at a bank where you're just get, you're probably getting piles of this crap on tables and you're floating through it. And for the previous three experiments, you've got to know the serial number. Not a, not, a, not a special mark, but the actual serial number, okay? It's kind of difficult to do that. So Hall, June 1944, basically sends a letter to Broughton and says, hey, listen, Got your stuff from March. We've gone ahead, we've printed these notes. Okay, we got 296 packages of R's, 296 packages of S's, uh, 4,000 notes a piece. I think it's 1,184,000 notes of each. All right. 
and that's just what's in here. And he's telling them that there's a special letter S and there's a special letter R printed on both those notes. All right, and here's the serial numbers here. Uh, they printed stars with them. Um, I think the first time, about 12,000 of each star. The other three experiments, I don't think they used the paper, but I don't quite know, but we have no serial numbers documented. So this is, not only do we have special overprinted, not, uh, special overprints on these notes, we actually have stars being printed on experimental paper. And of course, here's the two notes. Um, and you can see where the R and the S are pretty much in line with the bottom of the seal. Um, I don't know, under the C. Uh, they're there, they look real pretty. All right. Um, these are two stars. I, I searched Heritage this morning and realized I think the S's are, must be much scarcer than the R's. Um, the R's themselves are not common, but I only found one or two S's. I think, I didn't do too much research in here, but it might be hard for you guys to see, but that font on the R and S is very similar to the font that the BEP was using on the state names on 29 national banknotes. Um, I think this, in the front of my talk, you saw them. That was copper plate gothic, which I know is one of the fonts that was often used, but um, they're very similar as, as to the way they look. All right. Now, find me the experimental. Exactly. So now you can kind of see. It's much easier to see this note now that it's got the specially printed R on it. All right, so this is, okay, this is Broughton. So what they did was they shipped these things out from the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. He ships them all the notes and basically says, I'm sending you these 296 packages, actually 500 and whatever, there's 82 if I did my math right, 592 packages, these specially marked notes, okay? I want you to basically put them into circulation and he makes a comment that I want you to issue them in equal lots. So if you send eight of ours, I want you to send eight of S's. So he's trying not to bias the experiment by having all the R's go out and all the S's go out. He wants them all to go out so that they're gonna, at least from the, the get-go, face equal conditions and stuff like that. It's not necessary for the bank, he's telling them, to sort the R's and the S's. So they're gonna go out from the Chicago Fed Reserve Bank, they're gonna ship it to their branch banks, Branch banks are going to ship it to local banks, et cetera. And the notes are going to start to come back in as they're pulled from circulation. He instructed the bank, said, listen, you don't have to segregate the R's and the S's from silvers. Just segregate all the ones like you normally do and send them to me. All right. This became one of the issues that basically plagued the experiment from the start. Redemption problems just kind of killed it right from the beginning. And that's one of them there. So he's saying, hey, just segregate your ones like you normally do. Don't worry about R's and S's. Um, send them to us, and we'll take care of them right there. So O.J. Netterstrom, his vice president of Chicago Bank, basically gets the letter from Broughton and says, hey, no problem, great, we got these notes, we'll ship them out, we'll segregate them, it won't be a problem. He actually sent him a letter a few days later with the number paid out uh, and the serial numbers and the actual date that they were sent out. So let's back up for a second. So this is June 1916. Broughton's telling the bank he's going to get the notes. I believe the bank received them on the 21st, and within a week, they had sent all the notes out into circulation. So they were all circulated. Um, I don't know how many stars were circulated, but I like these things. When you kind of see these notes, you know, this kind of information, it's rare, but when you see it out there, it puts it out. So now the notes are out. They're in circulation. Okay. Then you see a letter like this. Uh, this is a guy named O.C. Phillips, manager, uh, money department, Federal Reserve Bank of, of St. Louis. He's actually email, uh, emailing, excuse me, send, <laughs> sending a letter to uh, Undersecretary Bell and saying, hey, listen, we got, we got these notes with R's and S's on them. What the heck are they? Because there was no, it wasn't a secret, obviously, you're putting R's and S's on the notes, but there was no treasury correspondence like a press statement or anything that said, hey, this is what we're doing. Okay, they just kind of went out in circulation. Partly why I think they do this because they don't want to alert the public who's then going to start to save these things as curiosities. And as we all know, well, that didn't work out too well anyway. So Treasury then puts a statement out July 4th, 1944. Um, basically says, you know, Treasury stated that in order to test certain technical aspects, we put out these two special lots of numbers. They got reds, R's, and S's on them. All right. So now you got to think. This is... June 1944, okay? What just happened? D-Day, all right? 
not just private, public offices and departments, they're bereft of employees. The men are overseas, all right? Um, so when they looked at the redemption issues of getting these notes back from circulation, one of the reasons they used an RNS was to make them more identifiable just for the purpose of that, but also because they knew that the workforce was a little weaker than it may have been when they were doing the original um, tests out there. So this, I, I, I had to crop some of this, but this is Nederstrom sending a note in October to basically Broughton, and he's basically saying, uh, listen, we're, we're having some issues, okay? This is causing us a problem. I, I, not quite sure why, because they didn't have to segregate anything, but I, I guess they were curiosities. They were slowing the process down. So Broughton responds to him and says, all right, um, sorry, went, went too far now. This is Broughton responding to Netterstrom. The banks are segregating ones and they're sending them back, and they go to the divisions of loans and currency. Broughton sends a letter to Netterstrom in October and says, we're having difficulties, the Treasury's having difficulties, because what's happening is they need to segregate out the R's and the S's from all the ones that they're getting, and they're getting backlogged. And they're not only getting backlogged with R's and S's, they're getting backlogged with all these $1 notes. So they can't do it. So I guess when you're in government, you can just go down to the bank and say, hey, listen, I want you guys to do it. So he goes to the bank and he says, I want you guys now to start segregating out R's and S's and $1 silvers and sending them to us in separate lots. So now the treasurer's going to get all the R's and S's they need. Uh, they don't have to segregate the R's and the S's from the S's. They can do it together. They're going to get separate lots of silver certificates. It's going to kind of cut their workforce down. Um, Netterstrom, of course, uh, was not too happy about this. Says basically it's now a separate sorting function for them because now they have to segregate out all the $1 silvers as from all anything else they're segregating out, then go back to them and segregate out the R's and the S's from the ones. Um, and I don't know how many redemption people or sorters would have been at some of these banks, maybe only a handful, I'm not sure. So probably put a big boon on their workforce to do that. Reluctantly, of course, he says, okay, we'll do it. So this goes on. So this is Broughton going back to Netterstrom. Now we're in December 1944. So these notes were issued in June. Now you're talking six months later, and they're still having problems with redemption, and it's causing some issues for the experiment. So... Broughton finally goes to Netterstrom and says, okay, I know we were having problems, I know you're having problems, but we need to get this thing going on. So he goes, why don't you just, instead of doing sorting all month long, just do it for the first six days of the month. So you still got to segregate them, but you can only do it, whatever, it's the first week of the month and then the rest of it you don't have to worry about. Um, I'm a scientist by training, I presume many of you are also scientists, or some of you you're kind of biased in your results here now because you may not get a lot of notes in the first month, the first week of the month, you may get more at the end of the month. So you've already kind of skewed your results by this, this kind of action here, but they didn't really have any choice on the matter. They, they kind of had to do it. And this is now Hall going to Broughton and basically confirming that, that you know, they'd cut the redemptions back to about once a week. So what was surprising when I started reading all this stuff was the, ver the first few documents were enlightening because they really explained how the experiment was undertook, how they got the notes, how they numbered them, they made the decision to put RNSs on them because they made the mistake in the past maybe of not identifying these notes when they need to get them back. You know, their results are only gonna be as good as their sample set. So if they only get a few back, it's hard to make some, you're going to make assumptions on basically those. They want as many back as they can. But what became more enlightening was that most of the documentation dealt with the problems they were having with redeeming. Um, why? Not quite sure why. That's not really delineated or, or explained in the letters, but they did. You know, Treasury gets backlogged. Now they push it over to the banks. The banks have issues with them, and so they cut it down. This is May 22nd, 1946. This is two years later. Uh, this is Hall now going to a man by the name of E.L. Kilby, who'd replaced William Broughton as commissioner of the public debt. Um, and he's basically saying, hey, listen, it's two years after we issued these notes. And in view of the fact that several changes were made in the method of segregating them, all right, the results cannot be calculated very well. 
So he's admitting, hey, listen, this test was kind of a failure. We really didn't get the number of notes we expected to get back. I didn't show it here, but one of the documents, is it 10,000? I think it, it, it was a note written by a Treasury employee. I think it was 10,000 R notes and like 9,500 S notes. It's something like, it's like less than 1% of all the notes that they actually got back from circulation. All right. So he finally goes to Kilby and says, hey, listen, we should just decide to end this thing and stop having these notes be segregated and counted and sent in from the banks. All right. Now this was, okay, I'm not sure. This was, a, a, this was the interesting thing here was this was just a file that was just kind of buried in there. Um, and I believe it was this guy, Justison, and he was sending it, I think, to BP Director Hotzclaw, who replaced Hall. And he made this comment down here. Mr. Hotzclaw recommended that the file on the experiment be considered closed. Now, they're talking about the RNSs. Um, because any findings developed would not be of no real value. And he makes this comment, because of later technical developments relating to the ink and certain processes used in the manufacture of the RNS certificates. So if you go back to kind of what Hall was saying in 1943, he didn't think this was really going to work because the paper wasn't very pragmatic when it came to putting it through the printing process. And this person here, uh, he's putting this file together for somebody in the Treasury, kind of repeating that process right there. Um, this is another file which kind of closed the whole thing. This is 1955. Um, you see a lot of this in the BPD files and even the correspondence files with the Bureau of Graving and Printing. The public wrote in constantly and asked lots of questions. Um, and you would think a lot of them are, hey, I got this funny note with like an orange seal. Is it really something different? And they say, no, it's just a washed red seal, blah, 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 blah. But every now and then you find something good in there that explains the process that was going on. So uh, this person, this treasury or this Bureau of Standards employee Euler is writing to just, I presume, some, some private citizen in San Diego. And they make this comment at here. Although some data was obtained as to the ratio of RNS notes returned as unfit, it was not possible to make a complete and accurate analysis of the results. So the BEP didn't get enough notes back. They didn't get them back in a certain period of time to make substantial um, analysis on it. And he goes on to say that the Difficulties were experienced with printing additional quantities of notes in special paper because this paper was not adaptable to the wet intaglio, uh, the wet intaglio process of printing observed in the production of United States currency. Uh, and that's exactly what Hall said in 1943. So a quick recap on these notes, all right. It's the fourth life test, at least that we're aware of, for small size that the BP put in the circulation. Okay, they make a great move of putting these pretty R's and S's on the notes. All right, it might have biased the test right from the start. They became curiosities, I'm sure, for the public. Uh, they're extremely common in, in uncirculated grades nowadays. Packs were probably saved. Um, they put the notes in the circulation. They try to help the sorters. All right, okay, that's great. However, redemption problems kind of plagued the experiment right from the end. Uh, maybe that was because so many of the notes were kept and not actually returned. Um, they found that even when you identify the notes, it still didn't make it easy to do because the division of loans and currency would have gotten these half-cut notes. They're all sprinkled together, and they still have to go through them and pull them out. So they get a backlog. They try to kick it down to the banks, and the banks just can't handle it. Um, I'm not sure how previous experiments were handled. I presume it was more difficult, but somehow, even though they, they tried real hard and they put these great letters on it, it still really didn't, didn't make anything, anything work real well. Um, luckily, we have two really fantastic notes out there, uh, the only experimentals with any kind of special overprint on them to identify them. Um, the paper was not changed, of course. Uh, melamine and any resin was never added to paper. Um, this is the last that I've read of this kind of test being conducted. You know, they did continue with um, uh, some more like the Gilberts in the 60s I mentioned. Natick was also a paper that was used in the 1970s. Um, but as far as this particular kind, they didn't go any, any, anywhere with it. Uh, they kept the same composition. I believe it was 75% cotton, 25% linen. Um, and it just, uh, it's interesting 
because they really use their experience from previous experiments to make this work. Um, the other issue with using R's and S's was they didn't have to segregate the serial number runs. Uh, with the XY's, with the 28 A's and B's, when they were issuing those, those serial number not, sequences were not actually in use. They weren't numbered for another three years on regular currency. So they thought, okay, let's use a special serial number sequence. Well, now you gotta, you gotta keep track of that. When they did the 35 A, B, C, B, and BBs, I believe that was a current serial number block at the time. And with the 35 A, X, Y, X, Y, and Zs, that was also a current serial number register at the time. Um, so they had to keep track of it. This they didn't really have to worry about. They could just number these as normal, segregate a, a bunch, you know, keeping track of the special paper, put the RNS on it, and, and kick it out. But as much as they tried to make it simpler, it just didn't work out. Um, and that's what I found actually with many of the experiments that I've seen was they were failures. They didn't work. The paper wasn't any better. Um, maybe it was better, sorry, but there's so many steps in producing currency from the pulp step of making the paper, from the wetting process, from the trimming process, from putting intaglio presses, uh, intaglio prints on it, from doing the serial numbering. It's very hard to get paper that passes all of those steps right there. And what Crane produced in the 1870s is still, I believe, the same composition that they're using today. That just has worked. Ray and Steve just spoke about Hawaii overprints. I don't know if they brought this note up or not. I, I saw part of it, but um, there's a reason why I'm showing it to you along with this note. Um, not only because you can see they were using the same serial number block, um, but these two notes share something in common that no other small size note does. Anybody want to hazard a guess? Say again, what was the question? These two notes share a characteristic that's not seen um, sorry, Hawaii notes and the RNS notes, the, 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 all denominations. 35A? No. Let me phrase the question. Hawaii overprint notes and RNS overprint notes share a characteristic that's not seen in any other small size currency. Yeah. Yeah. These are the only two types that actually have an overprint on US currency. That's it. No other currency. And I racked my brain on it. I want to make sure I was right on that question, but. Um, no other currency does. Um, you know, some people, North Africans did not. They had a different colored seal. Now, some people may make an argument for 29 FRBNs because they had like the little, what, the blocks at the top and stuff like that. But that was specific to the design of the note. Okay, here you're taking a normal $1 SC or a 5 or a 10 and a normal $1 SC and you're putting a special overprint on it. So it's the only two types. Thank you, guys. Question, how did they apply the R and S? Do you know? Was it part it's, of the Intaglio process? No, no, it would have been a separate printing. It would have been a separate print, just like they did the overprints on national banknotes. Um, it would have probably been, they probably created a logotype, which is a separate plate, printing plate. So they did the Intaglio process. They face and they back the sheet. That's one step. Then they would have numbered them with the seal and the serial number. That's the second step. And then in an identical process, they would have passed them through a third printing step to actually print the R's off. So they would have that had was a... was not or wasn't tied to the press? No, no, it would have been letter, letter press or, um, yeah, letter press or whatever. Whatever, what's that called? The yeah. Yeah. letter press, yeah, a letter, letter press. Okay. Letter press that would have done it. So, no, that's there, but it's the only way to get it on it. That's not gonna be in Talio. Okay, and early on you mentioned sizing. Did that disappear? Then no, that sizing day? was always there. I've seen a lot of, and you know, it, it frustrated me because I found this great website when I was doing this research. Um, and it just, it, it spoke about paper making and paper chemistry, but it, it was not a dictionary, but it just listed all these different terms. And, and sizing and platering I've seen, a lot of things. These were things that were done to the paper um, so that it wouldn't shrink as it was being dried and wetted uh, so that it would adhere inks a lot better. Um, so sizing was one. No, they, I, I believe, well, I, I don't know if it's still in process now. I see it a lot in the 1930s and the 1940s. Whether it's a process that's still needed nowadays, I'm not quite sure. Um, it may even related to the wet printing as it is today. So yeah, so it's, yeah, I believe it's all common to paper making.
you know, but I, I see it out there all the time. Bill. I just read recently, and I can't recall where, that somebody was uh, indicating that the star notes were printed on the same paper. Yes, they did. They printed star notes on SNRs. Okay, they, they just didn't, uh, but they didn't, they didn't have a special paper and a regular paper. They just yep. issued them on the... On no, the they had, no, they had overprinted R's and they had star notes with R's and S's on yes, them. Yes. I think 12,000 of each. But, but they didn't use different, I, I, I read that they used the same paper for both the R no. and S stars. The same paper as the regular notes. Yeah. Yeah. So they had R's with stars and regulars and they had S's with stars and regulars. Right. They printed, you know, 12,000, which is yeah, kind of odd, usually saying? for experiments. They were what? using the experimental paper on the stars, too. Yes. Well, this, guy, this guy said he's wrong. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, they, they did. They, 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 it was, they, they basically did regulars and stars on both types of paper. Now, they, obviously, the regular paper is just regular standard paper. It's the standard paper they use. But they did print stars, which is odd, because they've never done that before. Now, whether they used them, I have no clue. But you know, some got out, because you can find a few in circulation. Um, any, any indication on populations for the stars? I, I don't know. Um, some, I, some people may know that, but I don't really track them. I don't keep a census on them at all. Population of the stars? It's a pot, I mean, no, now something of the order of 50. Yeah, I know. I, I searched Heritage real quick. We're going to make Dave sick because he turned the thing around. I searched Heritage real quick this morning for, I think it was 1609, I think it was the Friedberg stars. I got 24 hits, and I think two were S's. And the rest were ours. Oh, oh. So um, they're, they're, they're not, the I don't think they're common. Like, you can go out probably on the floor and find a ton of R's and S's. Right I think they're extremely, they're very rare compared to the regular. I see them once or twice a year offered. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and see you probably not. Probably they're probably like one. I don't even know if you can find them or see. Yeah, Carl. I, uh, I had one question, uh, but I will, I'll mention an amusing comment on that one. but. Uh, the, uh, have you done any work on the chemistry? Is the R and S, is that the same red ink that they use on the, on the United States note seals? Uh, not the same shade, but you know, is it chemically the same know. or just I don't know. It's a good whatever question. they had? It looks a little, it looks a little pinker. Yeah. So I, I, don't, I don't know. It's possible, but I'm, I'm not sure. I didn't see anything in there that, you know, uh -huh. you find very little on inks. In the case of anywhere. the R and S stars, the uh, Logan Talks has pretty good statistics on that. It's between 50 and 100. I recall uh, Dean Oaks told me mine, uh, one of them is CU, the other is uh, AU, and they had just sold a pair and about very good for about 3,400. And uh, uh, I said to Dean Oaks, and he said, well, now that's just about the price I paid you for mine, but I think the grade was, a little, it was numerous years earlier. They are rare, but they're not impossibly rare. Um, but if you're going to get them in decent grade, you're going to pay quite a bit of money, a lot more than 3400 which is what I paid for mine from D Notes years ago. I know um, P had sent me an article on this, but I, I know, and I had heard this before I'd ever found this, that there was some hearsay get-go about the RNES standing for rayon and silk as far as the fibers that were put in the paper, and, and that's obviously not... Not, not true. Um, it was always silk paper, um, especially in regular, which I know has been known for decades. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I think when we find out exactly what was going on and what they were actually doing, you know, that's what I like to look for. And and you know, again, nobody's going to run out and pay ten times more for these notes because they know what they're made of. But um, the the experiments are probably the most surprising thing I see when I look through these records. Um, and it makes sense, you know, they're just trying to elongate the product that they make. But you see a lot of it, you know, and. Uh, those documents, I'll get to you in a second. So those documents I showed you in the beginning, I wish I had more. I wish I had more. And I'll publish them at some point because I know there's people who, when they see it, man, they're going to memorize every damn serial number on it and start looking for stuff. But, um, you know, like I said, it's great. And, and, but it, what's frustrating is you find it, but you don't find anything else that says whether or not they were. But that's the way. Get it out there and let you guys go crazy looking for it and stuff like that, all right? Um, yes, sir? Never any back to the T's from the titanium. No, and that was really, well, they, they did titanium oxide paper, but they didn't put T's on it. It's just, it, it was, um, and I, I, like I said, I, I, the article, I think I published it in 2016, and it's titled FA Titanium Dioxide Experimentals, I think. Um, it was 1935s, I believe, and it was FA blocks, and they were just, 
They, they didn't use a special serial number. They were printing FAs. They just grabbed this group of serial numbers and put it on this paper. They never ever printed it. But no, in this, in the, in this group, that reference to the T's, that's all I've ever found. Hmm. So I don't know why they didn't do it. Why they didn't do it, I don't, I don't quite know. They, they, just, they just pushed it on. But that was when I saw that. I was like, oh, wow. And that's the thing. You get the tip of the iceberg sometimes, but then you never find the rest of it <laughs> sinking under the water. So, yes, sir. Have there ever been any counterfeits found? With the RNS? Not that I'm yeah. aware of. I'm sure, yeah, probably, but I'm not, I'm not aware of it. There's a little gap between the R and the S. Someone oh, no. taken the red and made their own little R and S, and then we sell it because you can't remember all the numbers all the time. Yeah, yeah and, and if you looked at the two notes, like, like, like the gentleman here asked, it would have been a third. The, the entire process was two prints back in the face, and then the serial numbering in the seals was one print. And so then it would have had to pass these shoots through a fourth print to get the R on it. Um, and the R's, as was stated, was three eighths inch high or three eighths inch wide. I can't remember which one. But the R was a specific size. And if you notice the placement, what I've noticed by looking at these more was it was always in line with the bottom of the seal. If you drew a horizontal line, it, they, they, the seal and the R and the S sat on the same plane. And it, it looked, I had a, yeah, I had a gentleman, it was on the boards I asked, I mean, but I asked somebody to measure the distance. There's a little bit of fluctuation. You're going to see it. And you'll see the same fluctuation see in seals and serial numbers because of the press they're on. Uh, but yeah, it's a great question. And as Bob said, I'm, I'm sure there are. It's very easy to do. Yeah. So it's a common font, copper plate gothic, which it's, that's it. It looks like it's a common font. So yeah, it's very easy to I just sit the there. Boop, 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 boop. The guy was holding the thing. Yes. He rotated when he pressed and that's it. one way. If, they're, if it's tilted or rotated, you know, these are pretty much, you know, they're square with the dimensions of the note. If they're tilted and rotated on the wrong size. Or, um, you know, Joe Bowling, I'm sure, I don't know if he's here or not, but can give you everything you want to know on how to find a counterfeit RNS. But, mm -hmm. they're, yeah, they're very, you know what, I, I think if it's very easy to counterfeit, people are going to do it. And what do those <coughs> notes sell for in CU? Like a couple hundred bucks, yeah. right? You can get an SC35A for like $8 yeah. in CU. So think of the margin there by just sitting there all day long and doing this. But the fact is the serial numbers are known. So what you can yes. Yes. I mean, you can also take a well, 19, and that's the key too. The 1934 numbers. North Africa and scrape the but people A off. Will, and, people will do. And, people and, will but, do. but again, it's, it has to be a mule. Yeah. <laughs> and, do you do you know of any? I've heard about three of them. Have you ever no. seen one? No, but I noticed there was a guy going around way back when. There's a no. little run between the R and the S, and know? those are the ones that people how grasp. Many, how many notes were on the? Sh the well, these are printed? these are twelve subjects. So 12 subject sheets. Mm -hmm. So there would be 12 cards. Six and yes, six. Yeah. Yes. Six right. and okay. six. And then, and so then if they were counterfeited, they would have been done individually. Yeah. Yes. That's, oh, yeah, why, yeah, that's yeah. why you would tend to see this them. This is yes. 60, 70 days. Yes. Well, and, and like Carlson brought up, the, we have specific serial numbers for these. Yes. Yes. So I mean, that's the, the first dead giveaway. If you take it, compare it to mm -hmm. the range, if it's exactly. outside. Yeah. And they were printed in Hawaii's and North Africans and RNSs in yeah. the SC block. But you'll get pockets of just. Well, the other thing, uh, another you won't and, want and to tamper. People the, can the, take the, and uh, you stamp it on it. Yeah. Like that. A 1935A SC is a very common block, but it's not very common when it's a sandwich between the I don't no, know. No, no, some of those are short between. runs. Those yeah. command yeah, a considerable to, premium yeah, for those that go for group collection. And, the the and, the and that's yeah. that's what counterfeiters go on. People are just going to see the R. Nobody's nobody's going to check the serial number. They're going to. But today with the. So. All the literature is out there, including uh, everyone puts the serial. The same is true. There was a time when you could make money on a uh, on a on, on a 1934 A North Africa ten dollar North Africa scrape the eight. But again, it, it has to be a mule if it's a, a real one. I used to have small size guy. They're all gonna yeah. yeah. They, they've been known for decades. Yeah. yeah, they've been known for. They're very well known. So uh, they just didn't. We didn't know what it was. All right, but yeah, you'll find that serial number anywhere, anywhere. So you had mentioned that. Up there, you indicated were, there, were these circulated out of Louisville and found in St. Louis they, about 30 years ago. I yeah. listened to something very similar to this, and the vast majority were used in and around Chicago. Yeah, they went. They were sent to the Chicago Federal Reserve Bank. Yeah. Now, where they go from there, I'm not really in tune. Okay, I thought you said they probably sent them to their branch banks. Mm -hmm. Well, they sent them to their branch banks, and I don't know where the Chicago district branch banks yeah. are. And then they'll go out, but as they come back, they can come back anywhere. You know, they'll come back to any bank in the country and stuff like that. So yeah, that, I know the letter you're talking about. That was Louisville. I think that was a branch bank. Louisville, I thought you said St. Louis. Well, St. Louis. Yes, that was a branch. That was a 
Mm. Maybe in the same, the, 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 it may have been the St. Louis Fed, but that's what I mean. When they go out and they come back, they can control where they go out from, they can't control where they come back from. So somebody could have picked it up in Chicago, drawn out to California, mm -hmm. bought something in St. Louis, and it gets redeemed through the St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And that's normal. The Treasury knows that. Um, the Treasury knows that. You know, they issue this in Chicago because it's a huge district. They can kind of control it. They can tell Nederstrom, as they did, we want you to ship them out in identical lots. So they're trying to control the dispersion, but they expect them to come back from, the from anywhere. The center so. of the country. <laughs> yeah, well, Chicago was, Chicago was, you know, when you look at, when you look at small size notes, you have New York and Chicago, yeah. two huge printed districts. New York was huge printed because that's where all the international currency went out from. Yeah. So we shipped a lot of stuff to New York and it went out overseas. A lot of it stayed there. The New York district is actually extremely small. It's like half of Jersey and part of New York, but it's highly densely populated. Mm -hmm. Chicago um, is very densely populated, but all the notes in Chicago Local. stayed pretty domestically. So when they mm -hmm. sent it to the bank, Maybe some like the Canada or over the over the, the, the lakes, but most of that distribution stayed in the U.S. So that's why you see Chicago and, and New York being printed out there. That's why they're goads of, and in some cases, Chicago is actually more common than the New York note, depending on the denomination and the class that you're looking at. But that's why. Great. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it.